Hello everyone and welcome to this video. Uh, as you guys can read by the title, today we are going to be making an advanced platformer. And uh, I'm going to base it kind of uh, on this old Prince of Persia game. So um, we are going to focus a lot on making animations. For example, when you turn left or right. And when you jump, there are going to be different animations. And you will be able to climb lentils by. Yeah, like this. Yeah, and you're also able to die. But that isn't the point. Now let's go on to Game Maker Studio to start making the game. And I am back. And uh, as you can probably see, I am currently not in uh, Game Maker yet. I am actually in Paint. And that's just because I want to give you a quick idea on how the game is going to work. So uh, it's pretty much going to work like this. Uh, we have the player step event. And this is obviously uh, executed every frame of the game from the player object. And when that's up, uh, executed, instead of just you know running the step event itself, it will instead run a switch statement. And this over here will simply test if uh, the variable state is equal to any of these uh, values down here. And all of these values down here, they are going to be constants equal to a number. And uh, if that sounds a bit confusing, uh, I will show you. Uh, so let's say the variable state is equal to idle. Then it will go down here, and yes, it's equal to idle, so it will go out here. And under that, down here, we will then execute the script, idle script. And within on this uh, script, there are different step events. So it will simply execute a step event, and it will do this for all of these different ones. So uh, it will be a different step event from all of these. And this simply means that we can, um, well, make it so that after what the player is currently doing, it will be a different step event. And this is very useful so that we uh, won't uh, mess up the code because if we just have a whole lot of different if statements in within the step event or whatever, then it's easily going to be very messy. While this is way more clean and easy to uh, look at. Uh, on right now it isn't because I kind of am better drawing this, but I will show you it in Game Maker. So uh, let's go to Game Maker now. <laughs> and now we're in the Game Maker project. And as you might have noticed, I've already done a few things. Um, for example, I've made all the sprites. Uh, not all the sprites, but the sprites we're going to be using here for the first few tutorial uh, parts. So I've made the idle sprite, and the character idle sprite is simply a small animation of like... Yeah, it really isn't that small, it's like 200 images. And this is simply the spread that's just going to uh, loop when you're not doing anything. And I mean, of course, all these sprites sound very good because, well, I've made them and I'm horrible at making sprites. So uh, your sprites will be way better. Uh, and I've also made a start run sprite. And this is because in a game like this, we want it to be so that you can't go directly from staying still to running. So we have to have this small, like, what should we call it, this transition between the two sprites. So when you start running while you're in the idle, you will go to this sprite right here, to the start run. And when you have started running, and this has run through, it will continue on to the run animation. And this is my horrible run animation. And um, I also have uh, made a floor sprite, and this is pretty much a three-dimensional floor, because um, I want this game to be like a fake 3D effect, 2.5D kind of like. Yeah, kind of like the original Prince of Persia games from for the Super Nintendo. Uh, and as you can see, I've just set the modify mask, I've set it to manual, and then set it just to half. Because in that way, the player will be able to stand right here. Uh, you can, of course, just make your game completely uh, 2D and not use any of these perspective sprites or whatever. Uh, I just use this because, well, I thought some of you maybe will want to do that, and then I can tell you how I can do it. And um, so I have also made a wall. This is the bottom of the wall, and this is just a piece. And this is the top to the right. Uh, the top to the left, you do not need another sprite because this is just covered up by whatever is above the the wall or whatever. I will just try to show it. Uh, yeah, and the room editor looks really bad when you're using this 3D effects in Game Maker. But as you can see right here, over on this side, this covers this up. But the one on this side, it won't do that, but you can't see this because, well, I'm using the correct one. But if I use this one, you would be able to, like, see 
a part of the wall right here and it would look bad. But I'm just quickly going to show you the game so you can see how the 3D effect looks in game. Because obviously you can see it looks way better than in the room editor. This looks pretty cool if I should say so myself. And um, the way I've made the depth work is pretty much just under all of the 3D objects. I've gone in here and set the depth to minus ID. And ID is pretty much, um, let's say the first object you create in a room, it will get the lowest ID and then the next one will get a higher ID and it will just continue on like that. So this means that the objects uh, I create the first will be below the objects I create later. And this is very useful because in that way we can make the floor first and then we can make this uh, wall afterwards and then the wall would be above the floor within the game. But this doesn't work in the room editor and therefore it looks really stupid. So uh, yeah, Game Maker's room editor is pretty annoying when you're doing stuff like this. But we have to set up a bit of stuff to make this system over here work. Yeah, well first of all we have to set up all these constants because you can't just test if something is equal to idle if Game Maker doesn't know what idle is. So what we do can do is we go under macros and all configurations. Now we can make a new one right here and we can call it idle. So I'm just going to call this one idle and idle is going to be equal to zero. So whenever we write idle within Game Maker now it will get the value of zero. So let's add a new one and let's call this one uh, start run. And this one can be equals to one. And this is simply just that we don't have to remember all the numbers, instead we can just write this text because text is way easier to remember than numbers. Um, and I can also add one called run or running. And I'll set that one to two and now you can see they just kind of, I think you can, yeah there we go. Uh, and uh, I guess that's really the only ones we are going to use for this first part. Or maybe I'll speed it up this part because I think it's going to get pretty long. Um, so now when we have done all this stuff, we're just going to save and say yes. And then we can start by creating... Oh wait a second, I also have to show you one more thing. I've made a debug object. And this debug object is uh, simply something we're going to use when you run the game in debug mode. And you run the game in debug mode by pressing this red button. So we're going to have a persistent object. Persistent simply means that it isn't going to disappear between rooms. It's going to stay there forever, no matter what you do, other than if you destroy it, of course. And under the draw event, it's simply going to test if we are currently running the game in debug mode. And if this is the case, it's going to draw some information. So I'm just quickly going to create a font just to draw that information. I'm just going to call it font insert debug. And uh, we are of course going to use this to see information like frame rate and stuff like that when playing the game. And this is just an easy way to do it because if we uh, did it in another way, we'd ha we would have to remember to remove it before releasing the game. If you do that, it only displays while you're running in debug mode, you don't have to worry about that. And so now we have made the debug fund, so I'm just going to say under here, draw set fund fnt debug and then draw text color and uh, this is simply going to oh wait a second, really we have to probably use the draw to UI event instead I, yeah that's better because then it just draws it directly to the screen instead of just to the room so that's better so we're going to draw a text color and then we're going to draw it at 10 comma 10 and the string is going to be frames, uh, or FPS, I can just write, uh, and then plus, and then string, FPS. And uh, in this way you can simply see uh, what frames per second the game is going to run. This is pretty useful because then we can see how much the game is lagging. Uh, and we can see when it lags and stuff like that. That's good for debugging so that we can see if we have something. We should probably take a look at it and fix so that it will run more smoothly. And something that's probably even more useful we also need is the real FPS, and then of course we're going to lock the game to uh, frames per second, and uh, in this case we're going to lock it to 30 frames per second because that's just what I've made my sprites for. You can of course make it 60 frames per second if you want to, then you just have to make bigger sprites. Uh, so this always shows 30 if it isn't lagging it. It isn't going to show above 30. But the real FPS uh, shows the real frames per second, or what the frames per second would be if we hadn't locked it. So pretty much how quickly the game is able to run currently. And this is also nice to see because 
If you have a good computer, you won't notice when a the frame drops just using this frames per second, but you will be able to see it if you use the real one. So um, we are also going to show that. So we're going to say string real uh, if ps underscore real. Yeah, that's the thing. And then we're just going to make the color of c underscore white, c underscore white, c underscore white, c underscore white, because you have to write it four times because you can use transition effects if you write different colors and say to one. So as you can see right now, when you just run the game normally, Um, nothing happens. It doesn't draw any text or anything. But if you run it with the debug button right here, you will be able to see the FPS and the real FPS up here in the corner. So that's great. It works. And uh, now, when we have got this stuff up and working, we of course have to create the character. I will just quickly check how long I've been recording. Okay, for 8 minutes, I think we can just start creating the character. I won't finish him or anything, I'll just, you know what we're going to do, we're just going to do so that he can stand still and he can run, and that's going to be it. So uh, what we're going to do is we're going to create a new object, and I'm going to call this object obj underscore character, or maybe I should call it player, that's a bit easier to remember I think, obj player. And his sprite is going to be character idle. And something important we also have to do is we have to set his depth to let's just say minus uh I really don't know how high the IDs are so I just to be completely safe it's going to be drawn above everything else I'm just going to set it to a really low number. This just means he won't get drawn below or everything because that would be kind of annoying. So now he should be drawn above everything. So that's what we want. And also we have to set a mask. This is probably the most important thing because if you don't do this the game is going to glitch out a lot. Uh, because, well, obviously, the different spi sprites you can change to, they have different sizes and stuff. So this means that the modify mask, the collision uh, box, will be different. So, um, yeah, we wanted to always stay this uh, collision box, stay the same, pretty much. So what we're first of all going to do is we're going to um, create a new sprite and call it SGR underscore player mask. And uh, this is simply going to be a black box. And let's just take a look at how big the player is. Because uh, I'm not completely sure. Okay, he's around... How, much, how tall is he? He's around... He's around uh, 50 pixels tall and... Uh, I'm not sure how much he is. I'll just have to take a look. And... 30 pixels wide, so he's around 50 by 30. So, um, you have to make this one uh, 50 by 30. And this is pretty much just going to be the collision. This is how the game sees the player. The game isn't going to see the player as uh, this sprite, it's going to see it as this box. In that way, uh, the game will correctly trigger collisions and stuff like that. So, we're going to center this and um, make sure that, okay, it doesn't. You know what, I'm also just quickly going to do something else. I'm going to go under all the, the player sprites and just crop them. In that way, we will always get the same point at the player. And uh, then we'll always be in the right center of the player, because otherwise it will just be in the center of all the transparency too. So I'm going to crop all of his sprites. There we go. Now this player mask should work. So we're going to set the mask to um, mask player. Um, and uh, what we're also going to do is we are of course going to create a create event. And here uh, we're going to set all the important variables. Uh, first of all we're going to set his state because as I showed in here he's going to have a state that pretty much determines what he's going to do in his step event. So it's his state to uh, start being equal to idle. And um, if you just write idle without having set any constant down here it won't work. But because we set the constant uh, down in the uh, macros down here, it will come up at, as a constant own idle. So we can just choose that, and uh, now he's in idle mode in the beginning. And uh, we are also uh, going to create a step event. And uh, within the step event, as I said before, we aren't actually going to have any code saying what he will do. 
Instead, we're just going to um, call a few scripts. So the first script we're going to call is get input. And uh, this script doesn't actually exist, so we have to make it. And this script is pretty much just going to get keyboard input, because, well, that's pretty important to have that. <laughs> so um, let's create this script and call it uh, get input, because that was what I called it in the object. And it's just going to start by setting some different variables. And let's say it's going to start by setting the up variable. And up is going to be equal to um, keyboard uh, check vk underscore up all and you can make all by making these lines right here two of them that's all you cannot just write all I think but I like using these two lines just because I think it's quicker all keyboard check uh, ORD parenthesis w and um, this pretty much just does so that whenever uh, you press either the up button or the W button, the variable up will be set to true. And we are just quickly going to do the same thing with the rest of the directions. So we are going to set up and uh, down and left. And I'm sorry that my sister is currently screaming. But yeah, that's just what happens when you record while your family is at home. I hope you can't hear it here too much. Uh, so let's just set this down. This is left and this right and the uh, down is going to be S over here and uh, left is going to be A and right is going to be D so um, yeah now uh, this script pretty much just sets these variables uh, and we also quickly in the creative and just to avoid bugs this shouldn't be important you shouldn't have to do this but just to make sure you're just going to set them all the false this is always a good idea to just set all the variables in the beginning of the game. Um, we might also add some uh, more later to this one, like an attack button, but right now we just need the up, down, left and right buttons. So now when we have the input, we have to make a switch statement. And the switch statement is uh, like this. And then you have to write the variable you want to switch in here, and that's going to be state. And then uh, now we are going to go under here and uh, oh, wait a second, I'm not completely sure. Uh, I think, yeah, you have to do it like this. I'm pretty sure, yeah. Okay, and now we're going to say case idle colon. And this is pretty much just going to run the idle script. So what we're going to simply call right here is a script idle. And I'm just quickly going to, yeah, well, call in this column script and then the name. Because I don't like using anything in front of scripts, just because I think, well, that makes it kind of confusing. I wanted to be able to use like normal functions, so I uh, so I never write str in front of scripts. Uh, you can do that if you want to, but uh, I just don't. I like just having the name because that's easier to use, I think. And um, yeah, also we're going to say case uh, running. I think we call it yes. And that's going to. Oh, wait a second, I forgot. You just have to add a semicolon after the script. That's important because otherwise the game doesn't know when it's done with the case up here. Case running, we're going to say script running. And case uh, run start, I think we call it. Uh, start running. Yeah, start run. And that's going to run script start run. Okay, so now we have to create all of these different scripts, and this is going to be a bit difficult. Um, but let's get started. Uh, I really don't know if we should wait for the next part. You know what? I think we need, need to split up the tutorial right here, because otherwise it gets uh, way too long. It's almost 20 minutes now, I think. So uh, you know what, guys? I'm going to continue this on uh, right now, to continue recording. But uh, the part will be split up right here, so in, in the next video you will get the rest of this part pretty much. So thank you for watching uh, this video and see you in the next one. It will be out soon, I promise, I hope.